Our first speaker tonight is Professor Christian Book. Every project by Dr. Book asks a question, a radical question that points to the very limits of human knowledge and peers out over that horizon. His dissertation at York University, supervised by the revered feminist literary theorist Barbara Goddard, asked about the nature of truth given that our knowledge of reality is encoded in language and that language by its nature mutates constantly. He developed the project into the book Pataphysics, published by Northwestern University Press. That same year, he published his best-selling book of poems, Eunoia, a spectacular demonstration of the limits of expression using language under duress. He used onerous constraints to demonstrate a strange beauty the world had never seen before. His latest project, The Xenotext, asks about the limits of humanity by thinking about the precarity of life on Earth, especially during the Anthropocene, to imagine the nature of that fragility. By implanting his poem into the DNA of a bug that will outlast humanity, he asks us to imagine life on Earth after humans. Indeed, he makes use of a grim future from which, like Orpheus, even the poets will not be able to save us. He has warned us of this dire possibility, but is here today to show us other coordinates for other possible futures. Christian Book. A zoom lens for the future of the text. Consider this metaphor, one that conceptualists like me might prefer to conceive as literal, that letters of the alphabet resemble atomistic particles, both indivisible and combinatory. What might this trope imply if we deliberately misinterpret it as an axiom? Lucretius, in De Rerum Natura, coins the word Kleinemann to describe the swerve that besets all atoms as they fall along fixed lines through the void, colliding to make compounds. The trajectory of the Kleinemann zigs and zags, tracing a clinical line, manic in aim. Lucretius argues that just as the Kleinemann names the minimal errancy that divides the wood of the firs, ligna, from the heat of the fire, ignes. So also does the Kleinemann name the smallest aberration in writing, able to make the greatest difference in meaning. The difference of a single letter in the two words, voluntas and voluptas, at line 257 in book two, introduces a Kleinemann, for example, at the precise instant when Lucretius notes that the swerve allows us to rest from fate itself, either willful intent or soulful desire. The handwriting in the earliest instance of De Rerum Natura has obscured the proper letter N or P, so we do not know which one applies though both make sense. The letter, like the cat in the box of Erwin Schrodinger, exists in a superposition of uncertainties. When Murray Gelman borrows the word quark from Finnegan's Wake by James Joyce, so as to name the constituents of the nucleon, the physicist infringes upon this atomism which has transected theories of both matter and poetry since the time of Lucretius. The physicist reads a book that begins with the swerve of a river run during a fall of thunder, the text fusing words into portmanteaus that defeat spell checkers <laughs> because the text smashes phrases into each other like a particle collider creating exotic matter. The thunder words, for example, concatenate diction for thunder from Arabic, Greek, French, Swedish, among other languages. 
Baba badal garachta kamina ron kon ron ton ron tu on ton trovo runan skan tu hu runen frnak. The word quark, for example, is a portmanteau of the words quack and quart. First, the three cheers or quacks from the seagulls. Then the three drinks or quarts from the barmaids, all of whom salute the cuckolding of King Mark at sea by Tristan and Isolde. The lovers betray their liege, muster Mark, by drinking a mixture that causes the couple to trade free will, voluntas, for true love, voluptas, entangling the twosome in a fated triad where indeed the mark is king, intermixing the ingredients for each portmanteau. No quark can exist by itself, but in nucleonic particles, quarks always appear in triads, two down and one up in the case of any neutron N, two up and one down in the case of all protons P. All three quarks bound together by strong forces exchanged via gluons. Atoms can undergo beta decay, devolving into more stable arrays of nucleons. For example, N can decay into P if a quark randomly emits an electron and an anti-neutrino. Likewise, P can decay into N if a quark randomly emits a neutrino and an anti-electron. The emission of subatomic particles from an atom during such decay occurs because of quantum tunneling, and physicists can exploit this effect of quantum physics so as to build specialized microscopes sensitive enough to discern even a lone atom of hydrogen. IBM, for example, has used such a microscope in 1989 to position 35 atoms of xenon on a plate of cooled nickel so these dots of matter might spell out the trigram for the company, thereby producing the smallest artifact so far manufactured by humanity. If conceptualists study limit cases of writing, then surely atomic scales of expression qualify for investigation, as implied perhaps by a poem like Fact by Craig Dworkin, a conceptualist who lists upon inked paper the molecular components of the inked paper. When Anthony Atheron writes an anagram, he alludes to an elemental principle of matter, implying that every text consists of alphabetical permutations of other texts. Each line of his poem permutes the letters in the word permutations, so as to explain this idea. Atoms erupt in mutant prose. I turn a poem. Its matter is upon me to trap us in utopian terms. At resumption, I must open art or input a stem torn up as time. Use important permutations. You should clap at that, I think, <laughs> frankly. <laughs> Ten Maps of Sardonic Wit is a book by me. It's cover, <laughs> it's spine, it's pages, it's words, all constructed from thousands of Lego bricks. Each page depicts a single phrase of poetry, each of which permutes the fixed array of letters in the title of the work itself. Ten Maps of Sardonic Wit. Atoms in space now drift on a swift and epic storm. 
Soft wind can stir a poem. Snow fits an optic dream into a scant prism of dew. Words spin a faint comet. Some words, in fact, paint two stars of an epic mind. Manic words spit on fate. The book, like the poem, consists of discrete elements that a reader can dismantle and recombine to form a radically different structure. The book can disintegrate into a pile of studded plastic, whereby the reader can assemble this debris into an unrelated sculpture. The great order of the universe is my response to the 50th anniversary of the Lego patent. <laughs> Using conceptual procedures reminiscent of Sol Luit, this image enumerates every possible way of combining two Lego bricks, each one with eight studs. The great order of the universe comes with a caption that quotes verbatim this transcribed paragraph from the patent by Gottfried Kirk Christensen, who writes, toy elements of this kind will be referred to generally as building bricks. And the principal object of the invention is to provide improved coupling means for clamping such building bricks together in any desired relative position, thus providing for a vast variety of combinations of the bricks for making toy structures of many different kinds and shapes. The great order of the universe also comes with another caption that quotes verbatim this transcribed paragraph from a volume by Democritus, who likewise writes, Atoms bombard the unplumbable void, plunging like silvery raindrops, or drifting like twinkly hoarfrost, and by coalescing, if kindred, they cause things to appear, and by separating, if opposed, they cause things to vanish. And from these interknit vectors, objects interlock, forever becoming one prolific universe, distinctive for its mild infinitude of forms. By some miracle of happenstance, the two paragraphs are perfect anagrams of each other. You can clap, Christ. <laughs> Gregory Betts, our host. Hey, bring such anagrammatic permutations to the ultimate fruition in his book, If Language, which rearranges the 525 letters in a paragraph by Steve McCaffrey, doing so 56 times, so as to highlight a remarkable virtuosity under constraint. Now, I, of those of you who have a glass of wine, I hope that you might join me in applauding our host with three quarks for Mr. Mark. Hip, hip, hooray! Let me present to you one more anagram by me. Inspired by the renowned aphorism of William S. Burroughs, who declares that the word is now a virus, an atomically diminutive parasite that by some Kleinemann has fallen into our minds from outer space. Language is a virus from outer space. Language is a pursuer of covert aims. Language frames our virus as poetic. Language tapers our vicious frames. Language for us some is a corrupt sieve. Language for us promises a curative. Frederick Sanger in 1974, sequenced the atomic genome for the virus, Phi X174. And to his surprise, he discovered that the virus used overlapping interleaved instructions 
to encode more than one protein simultaneously within a single series of nucleotides. Frederick Sanger highlighted this section of gene A with its 121 codons because of its inordinate efficiency, heretofore unseen in nature, causing experts at the time to imagine that due to intelligent engineering by aliens, this virus might contain a message from outer space. Hiroshi Nakamura in 1982 noted that despite every failed effort to find a cryptogram in this gene, he could link together triplets of identical oligomers like AAA, CCC, GGG, and TTT to graph the stars in the constellation of Buodes, as seen from the planet Earth. Hiroshi Nakamura implied that genes in a viral phage like Phi X174 could carry star maps, indicating to a clever reader the stellar address of a remote author who could garner credit for the abiotic genesis of such a virus within the ecosystem of an exoplanet. Craig Venter in 2010 used automated chemistry to create such a bespoke species of synthetic bacterium, Mycoplasma laboratorium, otherwise nicknamed Cynthia, a cell bred with an artificially manufactured genome built from scratch by a computer. Craig Venter watermarked the genome by encoding into it a line from a portrait of the artist as a young man by James Joyce. To live, to err, to fall, to triumph, to recreate life out of life. Venter thus belauded the Kleinemann in the first cells of a synthetic ecosystem. The Xenotext is one of my own stranger things. <laughs> An example of living poetry. I am designing a bacterium that becomes not only an archive for storing a poem within a synthetic genome, but also a machine for writing a poem within a resultant protein. D. radiodurans is the proposed symbiote for my Xenotext, in part because this extremophile can survive without mutation in even the most lethal biomes, including the vacuum of outer space, thereby making the germ an immortal memorial for a poem. Imagine pairing off the letters of the alphabet so that they are mutually assigned to each other, knowing that of the 7,905,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,
In the poem Eurydice makes a womanly reply about the woeful decreation of life. The two texts allude to an elegiac history of idols in which a herd boy fails to charm a nymphette. The protein that enciphers the poem comes tagged with a fluorophore that causes the cell to glow red in the dark when the cell writes its text. The germ, in effect, fluoresces with a rubescence in a fey way that displays the rosiness assigned to the fairy in the poem itself. My gene XP13-4A has worked properly in E. coli, making me the first human in history to design a bacterium capable of writing a meaningful text in response to an enciphered gene. The dark blot in the second column from the left indicates the protein in the cell. I have borrowed time on a supercomputer so that I might perform simulations to determine the appearance of the protein expressed by E. coli. And this image depicts the molecular structure of the poem Eurydice after two femtoseconds of folding. This image depicts the embodiment of the xenotext as a sculptural translation built from toys used in labs to model atoms. The sculpture has appeared at the power plant in Toronto and the Museum of Contemporary Art in Denver, among other global venues. I have since implanted XP13-4A in cultures of D. radiodurans. And while the organism can integrate the gene into its chromosome, so as to glow in response. I have yet to detect the full mass of the protein since the cell metabolizes the poem too quickly for perusal. <laughs> After having spent $165,000 Canadian <laughs> to date on this project, more money than any advance for an edition of poetry in the history of publishing. <laughs> I have been working to appease this little god with more subtle assays that might inflect the Kleinemann of its atomic swerve. Writing at such atomic scales constitutes one of the limit cases of conceptualism, and such an idea for a poem cannot help but expand the ambits of poetry itself magnifying our conception of poetry to encompass even larger scales of expression for poetry. Keyes Bowick, in his essay, Cosmic View, from 1957, is the first human to convey the size of the cosmos via a series of scenic images, each scaled up by a power of 10 across 40 jumps in perspective from a sodium nucleus at 10 to the minus 15 meters, to a galactic cluster at 10 to the 24 meters. Cosmic View has inspired the beautiful, haunting photo play, Cosmic Zoom, illustrated in 1967 for the National Film Board of Canada by Eva Zsaj, who animates the essay by Keyes Bowick, zooming from the scale of a protein, excuse me, from the scale of a proton to the scale of a galaxy in eight minutes. Cosmic Zoom has, in turn, inspired the movie Powers of Ten, produced in 1977 by the designers at the Eames office, all of whom animate the essay by Keyes Bowick, traversing cosmic scales from a millionth of an angstrom to a hundred million light years. Each movie depicts the experience of the zoom as a kind of fall, either a falling away, as if pushed from a receding point, or a falling into, as if pulled down a swelling abyss. The viewers feel the climbing of their delirium during this zoom through a void. With the fall of this zoom in mind, let me display some of the conceivable dimensional limits for the minimal element of composition in poetry. For me, all concepts of poetry depend upon a premise about this unit 
or atom, which writers must recopy and adjoin. Conceptualists like me note that in a digital context, the subatomic component of writing is the pixel, a square equal to a bit of quantizable information, not unlike a unit of area in the Planck domain, the most infinitesimal instantiation of space-time. Zoom out. Jacques Derrida claims that the mark constitutes the minimal element of writing, what he calls the irreducible atom, at the asemic origin for the metaphysics of meaning itself. Be this origin in the biogenetic code of life or the cybernetic code of data. Zoom out. Isidora Isum claims, however, that the letter itself constitutes the minimal element of writing, what he calls the fraction of the word from which everything must be revealed, i.e., the asemic pieces of words pulverized into their alphabetical constituents. Zoom out. Charles Olson claims that the syllable constitutes the minimal element of writing, what he calls the smallest particle of all, situated at the place of the elements, of the minims of language, these particles of sound, each like a lone note of music. Zoom out. Ferdinand de Saussure claims that despite his own dubiety about its atomic status, the word as a value nevertheless resembles the minimal element of writing, what he calls the linguistic unit, i.e. something central in the mechanism of language. Zoom out. Jean-Francois Lyotard claims that the phrase constitutes the minimal element of writing, the only one that is indubitable because it is immediately presupposed as the most basic of links to which a genre of both rules and goals might apply. Zoom out. Ron Silliman claims that, au contraire, <laughs> the sentence must constitute the minimal element of writing, what he calls the unit of any literary product such that any further subdivision would leave one with an unusable fragment. Zoom out. Alexander Bain is the first of all English scholars to claim that the paragraph constitutes the minimal element of writing, what he calls a division of discourse, i.e. a main unit of thought, defined by its unity of purpose in a manner that recalls the poetic stanza. Zoom out. John Trimber claims that the page constitutes the minimal element of writing, what he calls the unit of discourse, i.e. the fundamental feature of print culture whose structural uniformity provides a metric for the length, if not the labor, of writing itself. Zoom out. Stéphane Mallarmé claims that the book constitutes the minimal element of writing, that at bottom there is only one attempted unknowingly by all who have written, its unity encompassing the world, i.e. everything exists to end up in a book. <laughs> Zoom out. Robert Croach might claim that the corpus constitutes the minimal element of writing, what he calls the poem as long as life a kind of life sentence in which the whole canon of works by a single writer becomes the main unit for authorial discourse. Zoom out. <laughs> Kenneth Goldsmith claims that the archive constitutes the minimal element of writing, since, as he notes, the digital genesis of any textual corpora now results at once in their curated storage with everything copied and stowed online in automated databases. Zoom out. <laughs> George Louis Borges imagines the extreme horizon for writing, an archive for every archive, 
a cosmically exhaustive repository containing every conceivable permutation of the alphabet, thereby reducing all subsequent authorship to preemptive plagiarism. <laughs> Disputes among poets might arise in part from disagreement about what constitutes the true unit of composition. And so far, conceptualism has explored the most extreme of all such units, be they at the atomistic scale of our DNA or the archivist scale of the NSA. Future scales of our civilization may in fact offer even more stupendous dimensions for expression, as implied, for example, by an artist like Vim Delvoy, who carves his poetry into mountainsides. Susan, out for a pizza, back in five minutes. George. Nikolai Kardashev categorizes civilizations based upon the amount of energy that a civilization can expend, measured in total watts over its lifetime, each type increasing its usage of power by 10 orders of magnitude above its prior stage of development. Type 1 Kardashev civilizations, like ours, might build megastructures large enough to cover a planet with writing for orbital readers as proposed in 1820 by Carl Gauss, hoping to plant wheat fields on tundras to convey axioms of geometry to lunar aliens. The Cydonia Planitia on Mars has inspired many pataphysicians to imagine that despite evidence to the contrary, this mesa displays evidence of intelligent inscription, including the ruins of monuments and pyramids all arranged in significant geometrical patterns. Luke Arnold notes that Type II Kardashev civilizations might build megastructures large enough to occlude the light from their star, producing visible shadows like trigons or louvers, detectable as writing in the transitive light curve from a luminary backdrop. The star KIC 8462852 is undergoing a recurrent, expanding occultation so titanic that no phenomenon in nature can readily explain the light curve of the ongoing dimming, causing some astronomers to imagine that a Dyson swarm of robots is engulfing the star. Jaron Lanier notes that Type III Kardashev civilizations might build megastructures large enough to require the reorganization of stellar systems into written symbols, what Lanier calls graph stellations, whose inscriptions might span an entire galaxy for aeons. The galaxy PGC 54559 constitutes such an enigma because, again, no phenomenon in nature can readily explain the formation of such a perfect annulus of stars arranged almost exclusively within the radius of habitable distances from the central radiant core. Stephen Hutsu notes that type four Kardashev civilizations might transmit messages at cosmic scales by manipulating the parameters for the microwave background during its formation, thereby leaving behind a signature upon the structure of the macrocosm. The Eridanus supervoid corresponds to such a cold spot in the microwave background, a spot so vast that no phenomenon in nature can explain its origin, causing some experts to think that the void provides evidence for tampering by forces from a parallel universe. While we honor the 50th anniversary of our boot prints and our tread marks upon the moon, let us recall that we have willingly broadcast messages by the pioneer probes and the voyager probes so as to address exo-civilizations above us in the Kardashev scale. The Xenotext participates in this legacy of exoplanetary transmission insofar as the poem constitutes a digital payload aboard a fleet of spacecraft launched by NASA into the void. The Xenotext resides, for example, aboard the MAVEN probe 
in orbit around Mars. The Xenotext also resides in a microchip aboard the InSight probe now conducting surveys at the Elysium Planitia on Mars, thereby making me the first of all poets to have delivered a poem to the surface of a world beyond the cislunar precinct of the Earth. <laughs> the Xenotext also resides in microchips aboard not only the OSIRIS-REx probe, currently visiting the asteroid 101955 Bennu, but also the Hayabusa 2 probe, currently visiting the asteroid 162173 Ryugu. My poem is the first to visit such planetesimals. The James Berg Earth Station in Carmel, California has beamed the Xenotext to the star Gliese 526 in the constellation of Buotes, 5.5 parsecs from Earth, doing so as part of a plan to communicate with any exo-civilization in orbit around such a red dwarf star. Conceptualists like me prepare poetry for the nomadic swerves of such cosmic envoys. But alas, our critics <laughs> might dismiss us as nothing more than traveling salesmen. <laughs> On a path, it is, dare we say, and be hard. <laughs> not permissible, not publishable, i.e., not poetry. Conceptualists, however, rest from the fateful decline of poetry, our free will, voluntas, with an N. If not our true love, voluptas, with a P. N.P. Nobilis Poetica. Poetry is freedom. Stop telling poetry what to do. It is an atom following the path of a Kleinemann on a whim. Ultimately, conceptualism zooms into the future of poetry beyond the demise of poetry, a demise upstaged in advance by other cultural concerns more epic than any poem, even one immortalized at the puny scale of an atom or at the vast scale of the void. Thank you, Gregory Betts, for all your hard work on our behalf. Slancha, my friend. Cheers.